I have been talking a lot lately uh, and praying a lot lately about transformation. I have been mentioning to you, I've been talking about it to people in, 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 in a form of just what I'm hoping God will do. I want God to transform me. I want God to transform my ministry. I want God to transform this church. I want God to transform the people in this church. I am been praying it. I've been looking for it. I've been asking God for it. I've been waiting on it. But I began to think, what is transformation? What's that going to look like for us? What is transformation going to look like in your life? Let's dive into some scripture today. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. I'm going to begin reading at verse number 12. It says, Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech, and are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lays over their heart. And whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Verse 18, But we all, with unveiled faces, behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord the Spirit. Father, I need you to help me. I trust you to give me every word that I'm going to need. And I pray that you would anoint me with a special anointing. I rely on you completely. Help our ears to be sensitive, our hearts and minds to be open. Transform us, I pray in Jesus' name. This is part one of, um, I don't know how many weeks we may go. So, uh, but if you're taking notes, this is part one. So what is transformation? What is transform what does it mean i found this very interesting definition it says to be changed a change or renewal from a life that no longer conforms to the ways of the world to one that pleases god a life that no longer conforms to the ways of the world paul's there if we really want transformation, our lives go from conforming to the identity what the world wants us to be to what the Word wants. We begin to leave the desires of our past sinful natures and we begin to hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're no longer trying to look like, smell like, act like, live like the world because I'm not trying to conform to the world. I'm trying to be transformed through Jesus Christ and the Word of God. So transformation is me saying goodbye to the things that I've held dear my entire life and hello to the will of God in my life. I'm no longer going to conform to the ways of the world, but I'm going to conform and change and be transformed. And now I'm going to believe and begin to move into the ways that are pleasing to God. I'm finally going to have a life that reflects Jesus. I'm finally going to act like Jesus, not just in church, but I'm going to act like him on my job when I'm tired and when I've been aggravated because I know that in transformation, I'm not going to be the same man I was that used to be the angry backbiter beating up somebody on the streets. Uh-oh. I'm going to finally have a life that is more obedient to God and his word and his spirit, spirit, then I am obedient to my flesh. You see, transformation is, I will not obey what my flesh wants. I'm going to obey what God wants for me. And if it goes outside of the longing and craving and desires of my flesh, I will have to just forsake my flesh and say yes to what God wants. Will it hurt? Yes. Will it be upsetting? Yes. Will it cause you to lose some friends? Absolutely. But in my life, I'm not here to try to collect a bunch of friends. I'm here to try to become like Jesus Christ. I'm here to be a witness, a liar and assault to the world. Same me, but a new me. Same me, but a different me. And listen, transformation is so much more than learning behaviors that the church wants you to act like. 
Because what we have learned to do is we have learned to transform. We call it transformation. But what in reality we're doing is we're learning to line up. We're learning to obey the rules. We're learning to say what the church wants us to say. We're learning to act like the church wants us to act. And all of that's not bad. You need to have discipline. You need to be able to control yourself. But what happens is we become like monkeys that are copying human behavior. You can teach a monkey to do all kind of stuff. You can teach him to smoke a cigarette. That's what they did in that one movie. Uh, I can't remember the Harry, Harry's Loose or Harry's some, you know, orangutan. I don't remember what name of that movie was. So you can teach them. You can teach them sign language and you can teach them all kind of stuff. But in their heart, they're what? Still a monkey. You can teach them all kind of tricks. You can teach a seal how to blow a horn. You can teach a dolphin how to jump through a hoop. You can teach a whale how to splash on command. But in the essence of who they are, they're still whales and they're still seals. They're still dolphins and they're still monkeys. And what I worry about is we have a bunch of church folk that are really still sinners learning how to behave on command instead of being transformed by the renewal of God's word. I am concerned that we have learned the pattern of behavior that we call Christianity, but it's not coming out of a heart, it's coming out of a discipline. And God doesn't want you to have to live out of the discipline. He wants you to act right because you're living through Him because He has transformed your life. In other words, you're living out of a posture that has humbled yourself under the hand of God instead of under the whip of some rule ordering church in other words I don't dress right because the teachings tell me to dress right I dress right because God oh Lord help me how did I get on dress I don't wear my hair the way the elders want me to wear my hair I wear my hair the way God has instructed me personally in other words, I'm living from a posture of prayer and a posture of obedience to the word of the Lord. To the, I don't go places not because the church tells me I can't go places. I don't go places because Jesus has transformed my life. And out of that, I am different. I want transformation. Let us not exhibit learned behavior. Let us have a heart posture that has been changed because we have been transformed Let's flip back to our text. I want to look at verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is liberty. So what's liberty? What is true liberty? Let me read you this incredible definition from the International Bible Encyclopedia. Well, I couldn't have worded it any better myself, not even close, actually. Liberty consists not simply in external freedom, or in possession of the formal power of choice, but in deliverance from the darkening of the mind, the tyranny of sinful lust, and the enthrallment of the will, induced by our morally corrupt state. In a positive respect, liberty consists in the possession of holiness with the will and the ability to do what is right and to do what is good. Such liberty is possibly only in a transformed condition of the soul and cannot exist apart from godliness. In other words, liberty only comes when I've had a transformation of my life. Listen, liberty. Oh, we pray for liberty, don't we? Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But you know what? I had a revelation this morning when I was reviewing this message and, and, and refreshing my mind on this message. And all of a sudden, I know I'm behind the eight ball. Everybody else has already had this revelation because here's what we have done. Uh, we have said, oh God, come on Jesus, come into this room. Come on Jesus, if you'll fill this atmosphere, there'll be liberty. But can I tell you what my revelation was? And I'm sorry, a preacher that's pastored this church for 14 years and it was an aha moment all these years later. Do you know what Jesus is talking about? He ain't talking about his spirit being in a room. He's not talking about his spirit being in your house. He's not talking about your spirit being in your job. He's not talking about his spirit being in your car. He's talking about his spirit being in you. 
So where the Spirit of the Lord is in me, there is liberty. In other words, I don't care how bound this room is, I am free. I don't care how soft everybody else is, in my spirit I'm free. I don't care how mean everybody else is on my job, in my spirit I am free. Because you can't find somebody that's been to the cross and has been transformed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh my God, I'm about to go somewhere. Because what has happened is the church is so easily uh, uh, obstructed and we're so easily hindered in our worship and we're so easily discouraged in our walk. You know why? Because we're expecting Christ to change the room instead of changing us. And if everything in the room is right, then I'll feel like worshiping. And if everything in the room is right, then I'm going to dance. And if everything in the room is right, then I'm going to be happy. No, joy comes from the Lord. It is from a change in my heart. It is from a posture of getting down and allowing the transformation of my spirit. I shouldn't be contaminated because I work in an environment that is pure hell. I shouldn't be contaminated because my husband's mean as a snake. I should not be contaminated because my kids are rebellion. You know why? They didn't give me my liberty and they can't take my liberty away. We have linked our liberty to sources outside instead of in here. So maybe we need to stop praying, God, let rise and fall and have liberty and begin to pray, God, you're in my life transforming me. Give me liberty. Or as that one famous statesman said, give me liberty or give me death. Either way, I'm going to gain. Amen. Let me read you another definition. This comes from a blog post by retired Pastor Terry Hyman. He says, in today's ever-expanding secular society, people eagerly embrace liberty, defining it as absolute freedom and insisting that they have the right to live as they please. There are no constraints because their self-defined right to freedom justifies whatever they choose to do. Such twisted thinking produces a world without boundaries where adults as well as children have difficulty discerning right from wrong. What we often forget is that liberty is unequivocally tied to responsibility. More liberty demands more accountability. Jesus confirmed this premise in the parable of the wise steward in Luke 12. He says, for unto whom much is given, of him shall much be required. Galatians 5.13 defines the limitations of our liberty. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. There were some believers in Galatia, just as they are in church today, who are abusing their liberty, using it as a justification for engaging in fleshly pursuits which are scripturally clearly condemned. Why do I need to preach on transformation? Why do I need to preach on the importance of rising from being transformed because we have began to misuse liberty and we have begun to abuse liberty. We as a church, not just in Rising Fund, but around America, we have began to link our liberty to the freedoms of the flesh. Instead of being committed to the Spirit. And if my flesh feels free, then I follow whatever my flesh tells me to do. We're using liberty to serve ourselves more than we are serving others. It's a posture of the heart. The posture of our heart is not toward God, it's toward us. So therefore we do everything us wants and not anything he wants. We're obedient to our lust and our desires. We're obedient to our goals and our dreams because ourselves are more important to please than God is pleased for Galatians chapter 5 verse 1, it was for freedom that Christ set you free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. Don't you realize on the day you got, came to the altar, Jesus Christ set you free. You need now to allow the gospel to transform you from a sinner to a saint. You need that sanctification process to change who you are and to change how you act and to change the way you think. We need to get the posture off of 
us. God, forgive us for being so self-indulgent. Forgive us for being so self-satisfying. And let us move to a transformation where it's all about God, all about His Word, all about His Spirit, all about His anointing, all about His presence, all about His freedom. Those that have been set free from sin and religious law should not seek again to turn their life back to sin. Why is the church dealing with such common worldly sins in the church and among the Christians? Well, y'all, y'all are real quiet. I'd have thought I was at a funeral home at midnight had I not heard that air conditioner event. Why are we dealing with such common sins among the brethren? Not sinners who come, the brethren. Paul taught in the New Testament, you are to warn, rebuke, you are to bring into, you are to save that brethren from hell by allowing correction in their life. We're spending so much time with problems among the saints, we can't reach the walls. Why? Because we've not yet been transformed. We're dealing with daily sins that sinners ought to deal with and saints ought to be free from. Jesus, I didn't know he was going to go this direction. The problem is we have learned the flows and the ebbs of the church and not of the spirit. We have learned the ebbs and the flows of making ourselves feel wanted and needed and exhilarated in our worship while God is in some distant space not being touched. We're abusing His grace and we're abusing His Spirit. We're calling things that are of God that God has not no part of because we have not yet been transformed by the anointing of a spirit. Watch this. It is the anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage but yet we claim to have an anointing but people are still bound. I'm talking about church folk, not sinners. How can the rising fine church of God be a soul winning station if our people are still bound by the sins that taunted them in their teenage years? How can we get adulterers free when people in the pews are committing adultery? We must have transformation. We must have a liberty that drives us to be obedient to the will of God, not to what I want. My liberty is not so that I can challenge His grace. My liberty is so that I can submit to His grace and submit to His power and submit to... What is liberty? Is it us dancing in church? Yes, but I've been freed. I got caught one time some yeah, a couple of years ago. Had my headphone in one ear and I was worshiping the Lord while watering flowers at work. I thought I was alone and I began to give me a little happy things. And I looked over and I went, oh Jesus, that lady is watching me right up here dance with this water hose. Because when we really have been transformed when we've really been made new in Christ, it doesn't take the cord of a certain modular system to cause the atmosphere to be right. It doesn't cause everything to be perfect in a worship service. Remember, liberty is when I have been in tune with God and I come to church with this posture. Oh my God, I submit to your will and to your way. Today, oh God, you're going to give me a word. Today, oh God, you're going to ignite me. Today, oh God, you're going to give me a fire that will sanctify me. Today, oh God, you're going to cause me to be usable because that old man on my job needs Jesus. I'm going to come to the house of God so that I can be a better effective witnesser outside of the church. Y'all with me today? Oh, Pastor Chris, you're supposed to be talking about transformation. You're getting stuck. Let's look. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. But let's go back now. I told you to keep your Bibles open. Is it all right if I teach a little bit? 
It is to y'all, but my wife's going to get on to me in kids' church for preaching too long. Although she has planned extra activities because I have a new way of preaching now. And I told her I can't be bound no more, honey, by this clock. I got to be have a little more freedom. Got to, I got to have a little more. Got to have a little more. So watch this now. Let's go to, let's, let's, let's first, let's hit verse 18. And then we'll jump up to, to verse 12. Verse 18 is um, where the, the, the context of our whole series is coming. But watch this. But we all with unveiled faces behold as in the mirror the glory of the Lord. Everybody stop there. Those with unveiled faces are beholding the glory of the Lord. Now let me stop and just teach for a second. Because what we, you have heard me, you've heard Mandy, you've heard Sunday school teachers, you've heard songs asking for the glory of the Lord. We've had sermons on the we must behold his glory. The veil, of, the veil must be removed from our face. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Beholding the mirror of the glory of the Lord. Watch this comma. Those that behold the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord of the Spirit. So what do we need to be transformed? Anybody say it? Gonna say it? Glory. His glory. If we're going to have transformation, the veil must be removed from our face and we must behold the glory of the Lord. I don't know. I was not in Brother Bain's father's services when he followed a, uh, followed those big evangelists that swept through the south and started Church of God's Buckaloo that went through and set up. A, I, I wasn't in those glory brush arbors of the day. But I know those people had a different level of faith than the local church of today because they had experienced a different level of glory than what the church experiences today. And therefore, they were transformed into a different level of intimacy with Christ because they saw the glory of God because the veil had been removed. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go, let's go back to verse 7. God help me not to belabor too long now. I don't want to be like one of you ladies that took y'all two days to have your baby. God, let me be like one of those that just pop it out in a hurry. Push, push. Woo, baby. Everybody with me? Verse 3. I mean, I'm sorry, verse 7, chapter 3. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, the Old Testament glory, the glory that was with Moses, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently on the face of Moses because of the glory of his fading, fading as it was, Paul's there at the comma. What's happening is that if the Old Testament contained so much glory, if the Old Covenant had so much glory, the people couldn't even look on the face of Moses, how will the ministry of the Spirit of Jesus fail to be even with more glory? In other words, if Moses walked down from the presence of God with a glory too bright to look upon, shouldn't us who are filled with the Spirit of Christ have even more glory operating in our lives? But yet, we have candles that cannot be seen. Lights that cannot light up a room. Push, Chris, quickly. Verse 9. For, watch this. For if the ministry of condemnation has glory, that's the old law, how much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory? The new covenant. I have a new covenant with the blood of Jesus Christ. Christ came to fulfill the works of the law. He came to fulfill all that Leviticus stuff we have to live through. Oh, he came to fulfill all those dots and all those crosses and, and, and T's. And he came to fulfill all of that. But so if that glory came, the ministry of righteousness ought to abound in glory. What's the ministry of righteousness? The ministry of Christ ought to abound in glory. What is the ministry of Christ in us? We are the ministry of Christ. Should we not abound in the glory of the Lord of heaven? If, a, if Moses shone in the glory of God, should not the church in rising fun who has a divine encounter with the Holy Ghost of heaven, the third part of the Trinity, should not the glory of God be revealed in our lives and shine through our actions because we've been transformed. If Moses can shine with glory, why can't we? Because we are the ministers of righteousness. 
Paul's there. We ought to be the ministers of righteousness. We ought to be those saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, submitted with a heart posture to the will and the obedience of the Spirit of God so that we can be works of righteousness. Verse 10, for indeed what had glory in the case has no glory because of the glory that surpasses. And in other words, oh, you can't even compare the glory of the old covenant compared to the glory of the new covenant. I'm going somewhere. Verse 12, therefore having such hope. What hope? The hope of the new glory. Oh, Johnny. Oh, watch. Watch this. I'm, 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 I'm birthing it quickly. Some. You'll just have to ponder it throughout the day. Why do I have hope? Because the glory of God is so much greater now than it was then. I'm not living with a glory that is outdated in the old covenant where I know I can never master the laws that they have required me to, but I'm living now in the dispensation of grace. I'm living in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit where sons and daughters are prophesying, where the power of the Holy Ghost is moving. The glory of God in the lives of transformed people ought to be expressing themselves. Therefore, I have hope. Why? Because in my life, I have a glory that I never thought I'd ever have. I have seen the glory of the Lord. Or have we? Have we even tasted His glory? Have we ever experienced His glory? If so, then why are we still attached to things the glory ought to burn off? Why are we still addicted to things the glory should deliver us from? Somebody say, I still love you, Pastor. For indeed what glory in this case has no glory because the glory that surpasses it, verse 11. But if that which fades away was glory, which much more glory is now remaining, verse 12. Therefore, having such a hope, we have great boldness in speech. What does hope cause you to do? Speak. Uh-oh. I'm wrestling in my mind, Sister Annette, whether to go where I, my mind's going. I mean this with no condemnation. I mean this with no negativity. There's something that I call the old rising fond spirit. You can't help it. You didn't bring it on. It's that spirit that makes us feel inferior to teach somebody else about Jesus. It's the spirit that tells you to always say no when Amy asks you to do something. Or Sister Dale's begging for you to have a... We have one Sunday school substitute teacher. Can't find nobody else to say yes. Mandy's been trying to teach discipleship in her class and don't nobody want to speak to nobody else about Jesus. Because we feel inadequate. We feel inward. We feel uncomfortable. We feel too shy. Uh, and I use the word backwards, but that's not what I really mean. But, we, we, but is it because we've not yet tapped into the hope of His glory? Because when the hope of His glory begins to be exposed in my life, all of a sudden I am being transformed to where now I have boldness of speech. I may not have all the right words, but I am not afraid to tell somebody about Jesus. I've tapped into the glory of the Lord. Therefore, I have the boldness to go where no man can go. I have the boldness and the security. Because why? I'm not operating in me. I've transformed by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, I am now walking in another dimension of faith while I'm living on this earth and I'm not walking with the condemnation of the law. I'm walking in the freedom that Christ has set me free in. Therefore, I'm not afraid to go to somebody and go, girl, you need Jesus. Boy, you're not living right. The problem is you, you've got to experience His glory. Okay, I'm going somewhere. Watch this. So let rising fun, let me, let me preface, let me, let me go ahead and say this. Let us experience the real glory. Not the glory that's going to cause chill bumps. Oh, the real glory will cause all kind of bumps. Let us not experience some kind of glory that's going to make us feel like we've accomplished something awesome. 
I believe when the real glory hits, we don't feel like we've accomplished anything, but we, we're humbled and we're repenting and we have a godless sorrow that causes us not to be able to get off the floor because I believe when the real Shekinah glory of God falls, it is more than a dance and a shout. It is a time of repentance and a time of mourning and a time of sorrow until we decide we want transformation in our lives. Okay, I'm hurrying. My labor pains, Timmy, they just keep on happening. Watch this, though, verse 13. And are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face, why? To hide the glory that it was fading. There was a veil there hiding the glory. Their minds became hard until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant. The same veil is hiding the glory. However, the veil remains unlifted. Watch. Because it was removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil covers the glory of their heart. But watch this, verse 16. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the hidden, the hiding, the veil is taken away. In other words, when I begin to put my faith in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden I begin to begin to experience the glory of the Lord and it's not like I thought it was going to be. And instantly it is in my faith in Jesus Christ, I begin to have a revelation of His glory and that revelation begins to transform me. Then what does it go right after that? Now... When the hidden glory is revealed by you trusting Christ as your Savior, now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. When? After I trust in God of heaven. After I believe that the man that died on that cross, Jesus, the man that never tasted sin, Jesus, the one born of a virgin, Jesus, the one that after he died on that cross three days, got out of that grave and is triumphant to this day, sitting on the right hand of God the Father, making intercession, waiting for the Father to give him the command to come rescue us out of this hell pit. But until then, I've got a faith in him that will transform my life because I have a revelation of his glory. And yet we've made salvation to be Jesus come into my heart. Amen. And it's much more than that. Oh Jesus, please don't let me misrepresent you here. Because once the glory is revealed, liberty comes in you. If you're battling with things in you, pray that God gives you another vision of His glory. Transformation. And I know what some of you are thinking, this series is going to last weeks? Lord, let it become sweeter. I'm almost done, I think, but I'm not sure. Because I, I, I put a little clock in my notes right here so that I would check the time to see if I should do these next few verses. It's 11 after. I'm going for it. Sister Ned, I'm going to go for it. I'm almost done. Don't get lost with me. You lost? Look at verse chapter 4. Therefore, since we have this ministry, what ministry? The apostolic ministry. But what, what ministry do we have? The ministry of glory. We now have a ministry of glory. We receive mercy and we do not lose heart. Watch this. This is all going to make sense. The church that has experienced the glory by putting faith in Jesus Christ has now a ministry of glory. Not a ministry of resistance. A ministry of His glory. Verse 2. But watch this. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame. Anybody ever dealt with shame? Renounce it. Not walking in craftiness. Not walking in a, by adulterating the word of God. But watch this right here. But by the manifestation of truth. Who is truth? Jesus. Watch this. So transformation 
is a manifest, causes you to have a, be a, have a manifestation of truth. In other words, we are a manifestation of Jesus the Christ. Didn't call us Jesus, didn't call us the Christ, but people are having a manifestation of Jesus in your life because you've seen his glory and you've tapped into his faith and because your life has been transformed by the word of God, you are now a manifestation of Jesus to those that are lost in the world. Hmm. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Verse 3. Even if our gospel is veiled, even if our gospel is hidden, who's it hidden to? To those who are perishing. Do you have a covering on the glory of God in your life? Are you hiding the works of Christ in your life? Are you hiding the manifestation of truth in your life? In those whose case... The God of this world has blinded the hearts of the unbeliever so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves. Oh, what? Verse 5. But we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as a bond servant for Jesus' sake. In other words, we have long forgotten when we have transformation, we have long forgotten about preaching about ourselves. We're now preaching as a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Why? Because I'm trying to be a manifestation of the Son of God, not the Son of Billy Ray and Gloria Hagler. For God said... For God who said, let light shall come out of darkness is the one who's shown in your hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. What are you called to do? To allow the light of glory to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. You know what the problem with the modern church is? We have more power from ourselves than not of God. We have learned how to create a church without the power of the Holy Ghost. We've learned how to segment services that look like the Holy Ghost but ain't the Holy Ghost. We've learned how to motivate people but we've not learned how to disciple people. We've learned how to motivate people but we've learned, not learned how to train people. We've learned how to motivate people but the posture of their heart is wrong and they're like a donkey they're like a monkey they're like a horse they're like a giraffe you can, you can train I don't know if giraffes are trainable or not but you're lear you have learned a behavior instead of being transformed into the image of Christ to display his glory we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not despairing. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus. Oh, my goodness. In other words, we're going through hell on earth. We've got problems. We've got adversities. We've got anxiety. We're, we, we've got enemies. But I am not destroyed. Because, it, watch verse 10. Inside of me is the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus, whoa, what may be manifested in our bodies. In other words, even when I'm being pressed, Jesus is being manifested. Even when I'm being tormented, Jesus is being manifested. Even when I'm depressed, Jesus is being manifested. Even when I've got bad reports from the doctor and disease that struck my body, Jesus is being manifested. Why? Because I tapped into the glory of the Lord and that glory is not affected by disease or depression. That glory is not dimmed by adversity. That glory is not dimmed by attack. But the glory of God is still in my life to manifest Christ. Verse 11, I'm almost done, Nikki. Find some music that's playing so people will think I'm quitting. It'll make them feel better. Although my wife last week said, you sure did preach a long time after that music started. She's keeping me on my toes, man. She said, why don't you just start the music later? Because it makes y'all feel better. It's like, ooh, yeah, we can, I'm going to get my purse ready. We're leaving. 
Always caring about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our body. Look at verse 11. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. In other words, we're dying for the sake of Jesus. Why? Again, verse 11. So that the life of Jesus may be manifested in the mortal flesh. And verse 12. So death works in us, but it produces life in you. But having the same spirit of faith, according to that which is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, therefore we speak. You better stand. That makes you feel even more like believing. I've noticed, Sister Summer, not talking about you because you write notes. Or doodling, I don't know which one. I've noticed some of y'all stay seated when I start my altar call. Because y'all know you're going to stand a while. I want to read these last couple of verses, and I really am done. Death works in us, but it produces life in you. This is what the church ought to act like. This is what a transformed church ought to look like. This is, I'm way behind on the clicker. This is how we ought to be. Death works in us, but it produces life in you. Verse 13, having the same spirit of faith, I believe, therefore I spoke, therefore we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you. I want to be, I want to be transformed. I don't want to be another old monkey learning some tricks. Learning the behavior of how to preach a good sermon or how to write a good sermon. God's messed all that up, Sister Stacy. What I want is to have so much faith in Him. I speak because something inside of me will not allow me to keep silent. Because I am linked to Him and not to me. I wonder if we could see in ourselves that there's a I know those little things where there's the devil on one side and an angel on the other and it's got your face on it. I wonder if in our spirit there's us and there's the spirit and we lean more to the posture of us than we do the posture of the spirit. Because the Bible says if we believe, we therefore speak. Can I say it like this? If we have experienced his glory, we too will speak. Because I have so much hope in the glory that resides in me know it's for your sake. Are you at a place in your life where you say, I know this persecution will present so much manifestation that it will do good for you? I have a pastor that comes to my shop. Pastors of Baptist Church. Wow, he loves the Lord. You can just see Jesus twinkling in his eyes when he talks. Pastor Roger. He's having surgery on his back. I believe this is July the 12th or something like that. And we were talking and he said, we're talking about just pastoral stuff. And you know what he said? He said, Brother Chris, I'm not really worried about the pain. I've got a pretty high pain tolerance. I'm not even worried. I just know other people go through worse things than I do. And if I can go through this, maybe somebody can see Jesus. Maybe you're going through what you're going through because... God wants the Spirit to manifest in you to somebody else. He's calling us to get transformed, changed, from a life that surrenders to our will, to His will, to tap into His glory so that others can have the manifestation of Jesus. Who are you showing to a dark world? Are you showing yourself? Or are you manifesting this scripture gives us the power of manifesting Jesus to the lost world. Can I just ask you to come to the altar, everyone who will, if you really want God to transform, if you really want a manifestation. See, I, you know what I'm, I taught on this in the, in the, in the firehouse over here. And it's something that I've taught, you know, most of the times I can't remember what I taught last week. But on a Wednesday night, 
with khakis, probably had sweat in the bends of my knees, and a short sleeve shirt with sweat dripping from my t- fingertips over in the wilderness. I taught on uh, manifestation. Manifestation is an easy to see, an easy to understand, and an easy to explain visitation of Christ. In other words, people can look at Sister Annette and easily see and easily understand that Jesus is coming out of her. Do they see that in you? Do they see that in me? Do they see that in our church? Have we learned behavior but not yet been transformed? Let's pray. Father, you have given us a heavy word today. I'm thankful that we've learned the behaviors. But God, I want us to have a posture, the heart of God. I pray, God, that you would begin to transform us. And God, I realize that means there's going to be times of forsaking. There's going to be some times we got to fight with ourselves so that you can be manifested. But God, in our breaking times, I want people to see you. I want us to taste the glory so that we cannot hold back. That we'll have so much hope because of the glory that's been deposited in our lives. We speak with boldness and we speak with courage. We speak and Jesus is manifested because we behold the glory of the Lord. And I realize, God, when we behold that glory, it's going to rip away some things and some of my flesh is going to hurt. I'll have to repent of some things that I thought were okay. I'll have to bow and surrender some things that I thought was permissible. But God, I want you to transform us. Come on, I want you to pray your prayer right now. Pray that you are transformed. Pray that the work begins right now in this glory. God, I pray that you expose your glory to us. Lord, transform us. Change us. 